The Call of the Canyon by Zane Gray. Chapter 7, Part 1. The day came when Carley asked Mrs. Hutter, Will you please put up a nice lunch for Glenn and me? I'm going to walk down to his farm where he's working and surprise him. That's a downright fine idea, declared Mrs. Hutter, and forthwith bustled away to comply with Carley's request. So presently Carley found herself carrying a bountiful basket on her arm, faring forth on an adventure that both thrilled and depressed her. Long before this hour, something about Glenn's work had quickened her pulse and given rise to an inexplicable admiration. That he was big and strong enough to do such labor made her proud. That he might want to go on doing it made her ponder and brood. The morning resembled one of those rare eastern days in June, when the air appeared flooded by rich thick amber light. Only the sun here was hotter and the shade cooler. Carley took the trail below where the West Fork emptied its golden green waters into Oak Creek. The red walls seemed to dream and wait under the blaze of the sun. The heat lay like a blanket over the still foliage. The birds were quiet. Only the murmuring stream broke the silence of the canyon. Never had Carley felt more the isolation and solitude of Oak Creek Canyon. Far indeed from the maddening crowd. Only Carly's stubbornness kept her from acknowledging the sense of peace that enveloped her, that and the consciousness of her own discontent. What would it be like to come to this canyon, to give up to its enchantments, that, like many another disturbing thought, had to go unanswered, to be driven into the closed chambers of Carly's mind, there to germinate subconsciously and stalk forth some day to overwhelm her? The trail led along the creek, threading a maze of boulders, passing into the shade of cottonwoods, and crossing sun-flecked patches of sand. Carly's every step seemed to become slower. Regrets were assailing her. Long indeed she had overstayed her visit to the west. She must not linger there indefinitely. And mingled with misgiving was a surprise that she had not tired of Oak Creek. In spite of all, and the dislike she vaunted to herself, the truth stared at her. She was not tired. The long-delayed visit to see Glenn working on his own farm must result in her talking to him about his work, and in a way not quite clear, she regretted the necessity for it. To disapprove of Glenn, she received faint intimations of wavering, of uncertainty, of vague doubt. But these were cried down by the dominant an habitual voice of her personality. Presently, through the shaded and shadowed breath of the belt of forest, she saw gleams of a sunlit clearing, and crossing this space to the border of trees, she peered forth, hoping to espy Glenn at his labors. She saw an old shack and irregular lines of rude fence built of poles of all sizes and shapes, and several plots of bare yellow ground leading up toward the west side of the canyon wall. Could this clearing be Glenn's farm? Surely she had missed it, or had not gone far enough. This was not a farm, but a slash in the forested level of the canyon floor, bare and somehow hideous. Dead trees were standing in the lots. They had been ringed deeply at the base by an axe to kill them, and so prevent their foliage from shading the soil. Carly saw a long pile of rocks, that evidently had been carried from the ploughed ground. There was no neatness, no regularity, although there was abundant evidence of toil. To clear that rugged space, to fence it and plough it, appeared at once to Carly an extremely strenuous and useless task. Carly persuaded herself that this must be the plot of ground belonging to the herder Charlie, and she was about to turn on down the creek when far up under the bluff she espied a man. He was stalking along and bending down, stalking along and bending down. She recognized Glenn. He was planting something in the yellow soil. Curiously, Carly watched him and did not allow her mind to become concerned with the somewhat painful swell of her heart. What a stride he had! How vigorous he looked and earnest! He was as intent upon this job as if he had been a rustic. He might have been failing to do it well but he most certainly was doing it conscientiously. 
once he had said to her that a man should never be judged by the result of his labors but by the nature of his effort a man might strive with all his heart and strength yet fail carley watched him striding along and bending down absorbed in his task unmindful of the glaring hot sun and somehow to her singularly detached from life wherein she had once moved and to which she yearned to take him back suddenly an unaccountable flashing query assailed her conscience how dare she want to take him back she seemed as shocked as if some stranger had accosted her what was this dimming of her eyes this inward tremulousness, this damned tide beating at the unknown and riveted gate of her intelligence she felt more then than she dared to face she struggled against something in herself the old habit of mind instinctively resisted the new the strange but she did not come off wholly victorious the carley birch whom she recognized as of old passionately hated this life and work of glenn kilbourne's but the rebel self an unaccountable and defiant carley loved him all the better for them carley drew a long deep breath before she called glenn this meeting would be momentous and she felt no absolute surety of herself manifestly he was surprised to hear her call and dropping his sack and implement he hurried across the tilled ground sending up puffs of dust he vaulted the rude fence of poles and upon sight of her called out lustily how big and virile he looked yet he was gaunt and strained it struck carley that he had not looked so upon her arrival at oak creek had she worried him the query gave her a pang sir tiller of the field said carley gaily see your dinner i brought it and i'm going to share it the old darling he replied and gave her an embrace that left her cheek moist with the sweat of his he smelled of dust and earth and his body was hot i wish to god it could be true for always his loving bearish onslaught and his words quite silenced carley how at critical moments he always said the thing that hurt her or inhibited her she essayed a smile as she drew back from him it's sure good of you he said taking the basket i was thinking i'd be through work sooner today and was sorry i had not made a date with you come we'll find a place to sit whereupon he led her back under the trees to a half sunny half shady bench of rock overhanging the stream great pines overshadowed a still eddying pool a number of brown butterflies hovered over the water and small trout floated like spotted feathers just under the surface drowsy summer enfolded the sylvan scene glenn knelt at the edge of the brook and plunging his hands in he splashed like a huge dog and bathed his hot face and head and then turned to carley with gay words and laughter while he wiped himself dry with a large red scarf carley was not proof against the virility of him then and at the moment no matter what it was that had made him the man he looked she loved it i'll sit in the sun he said designating a place when you're hot you mustn't rest in the shade unless you've a coat or sweater but you sit here in the shade glenn that'll put us too far apart complained carley i'll sit in the sun with you the delightful simplicity and happiness of the ensuing hour was something carley believed she would never forget there we've licked the platter clean she said what starved bears we were i wonder if i shall ever enjoy eating when i get home i used to be so finicky and picky carley don't talk about home said glenn appealingly you dear old farmer i'd love to stay here and just dream forever replied carley earnestly but i came on a purpose to talk seriously oh you did about what he returned with some quick indefinable change of tone and expression well first about your work i know i hurt your feelings when i wouldn't listen but i wasn't ready i wanted to to just be gay with you for a while don't think i wasn't interested i was and now i'm ready to hear all about it and everything she smiled at him bravely and she knew that unless some unforeseen shock upset her composure she would be able to conceal from him anything which might hurt his feelings you do look serious he said with keen eyes on her just what are your business relations with hutter she inquired 
I'm simply working for him, replied Glenn. My aim is to get an interest in his sheep, and I expect to some day. We have some plans, and one of them is the development of that deep lake section. You remember, you were with us. The day spill beans spilled you. Yes, I remember. It was a pretty place, she replied. Carly did not tell him that for a month past she had owned the deep lake section of 640 acres. She had, in fact, instructed Hutter to purchase it and to keep the transaction a secret for the present. Carly had never been able to understand the impulse that prompted her to do it. But as Hutter had assured her it was a remarkably good investment on very little capital, she had tried to persuade herself of its advantages. Back of it all had been an irresistible desire to be able some day to present to Glenn this ranch site he loved. She had concluded he would never wholly disassociate himself from this West, and as he would visit it now and then, she had already begun forming plans of her own. She could stand a month in Arizona at long intervals. Hutter and I will go into cattle raising some day, went on Glenn, and that deep lake place is what I want for myself. What work are you doing for Hutter? asked Carly. Anything from building fence to cutting timber, laughed Glenn. I've not yet the experience to be a foreman like Lee Stanton. Besides, I have a little business all my own. I put all my money in that. You mean here, this, this farm? Yes, and the stock I'm raising. You see, I have to feed corn. And believe me, Carly, those cornfields represent some job. I can well believe that, replied Carly. You, you looked it. Oh, the hard work is over. All I have to do now is to plant and keep the weeds out. Glenn, do sheep eat corn? I plant corn to feed my hogs. Hogs? she echoed vaguely. Yes, hogs, he said, with quiet gravity. The first day you visited my cabin, I told you I raised hogs, and I fried my own ham for your dinner. Is that what you, you put your money in? Yes, and Hutter says I've done well. Hogs, ejaculated Carly, aghast. My dear, are you growing dull of comprehension, retorted Glenn. H-O-G-S. He spelled the word out. I'm in the hog-raising business, and pretty blamed well pleased over my success so far. Carly caught herself in time to quell outwardly a shock of amaze and revulsion. She laughed and exclaimed against her stupidity. The look of Glenn was no less astounding than the content of his words. He was actually proud of his work. Moreover, he showed not the least sign that he had any idea such information might be startlingly obnoxious to his fiancée. "'Glenn, it's so, so queer,' she ejaculated, "'that you, Glenn Kilbourne, should ever go in for, for hogs. It's unbelievable. How'd you ever, ever happen to do it?' "'By heaven, you're hard on me,' he burst out in sudden, dark, fierce passion. "'How'd I ever happen to do it? What was there left for me? I gave my soul and my heart and body to the government, to fight for my country. I came home a wreck. What did my government do for me? What did my employers do for me? What did the people I fought for do for me? Nothing. So help me God, nothing. I got a ribbon and a bouquet, a little applause for an hour, and then the sight of me sickened my countrymen. I was broken and used. I was absolutely forgotten. My body, my life, my soul meant all to me. My future was ruined, but I wanted to live. I had killed men who had never harmed me, and I was not fit to die. I tried to live, so I fought out my battle alone, alone. No one understood, no one cared. I came west to keep from dying of consumption in sight of the indifferent mob, for whom I had sacrificed myself. I chose to die on my feet, away off alone somewhere. But I got well. And what made me well, and saved my soul, was the first work that offered, raising and tending hogs. The dead whiteness of Glenn's face, the lightning scorn of his eyes, the grim stark strangeness of him then had for Carly a terrible harmony with this passionate denunciation of her, of her kind, of the America for whom he had lost all. Oh, Glenn, forgive me, she faltered. I was only talking. What do I know? Oh, I'm blind, blind and little. 
but she could not bear to face him for a moment and she hung her head her intelligence seemed concentrating swift wild thoughts round the shock to her consciousness by that terrible expression of his face by those thundering words of scorn would she come to realize the mighty truth of his descent into the abyss and his rise to the heights vaguely she began to see an awful sense of her deadness of her soul blighting selfishness began to dawn upon her as something monstrous out of dim gray obscurity she trembled under the reality of thoughts that were not new how she had babbled about glenn and the crippled soldiers how she had imagined she sympathized but she had only been a vain worldly complacent effusive little fool she had here the shock of her life and she sensed a greater one impossible to grasp carley that was coming to you said glenn presently with deep heavy expulsion of breath i only know i love you more more she cried wildly looking up and wanting desperately to throw herself in his arms i guess you do a little he replied sometimes i feel you are a kid then again you represent the world your world with this age-old custom it's unalterable but carley let's get back to my work yes yes exclaimed carley gladly i'm ready to to go pet your hogs anything by george i'll take you up he declared i bet you won't go near one of my hog pens lead me to it she replied with a hilarity that was only a nervous reversion of her state well maybe i'd better hedge on my bet he said laughing again you have more in you than i suspect you sure fooled me when you stood for the sheep dip but come on i'll take you anyway so that was how carley found herself walking arm in arm with glenn down the canyon trail a few moments of action gave her at least an appearance of outward composure and the state of her emotion was so strained and intense that her slightest show of interest must deceive glenn into thinking her eager responsive enthusiastic it certainly appeared to loosen his tongue but carley knew she was farther from normal than ever before in her life and that the subtle inscrutable woman's intuition of her presaged another shock just as she had seemed to change so had the aspects of the canyon undergone some elusive transformation the beauty of green foliage and amber stream and brown tree trunks and gray rocks and red walls was there and the summer drowsiness and languor lay as deep and the loneliness and solitude brooded with the same eternal significance but some nameless enchantment perhaps of hope seemed no longer to encompass her a blow had fallen upon her the nature of which only time could divulge glenn led her around the clearing and up to the base of the west wall where against the shelving portion of the cliff had been constructed a rude fence of poles it formed three sides of a pen and the fourth side was solid rock a bushy cedar tree stood in the center water flowed from under the cliff which accounted for the boggy condition of the red earth this pen was occupied by a huge sow and a litter of pigs carley climbed on the fence and sat there while glenn leaned over the top pole and began to wax eloquent on a subject evidently dear to his heart today of all days carley made an inspiring listener even the shiny muddy suspicious old sow in no wise daunted her fictitious courage that filthy pen of mud a foot deep and of odor rancid had no terrors for her with an arm round glenn's shoulder she watched the rooting and squealing little pigs and was amused and interested as if they were far removed from the vital issue of the hour but all the time as she looked and laughed and encouraged glenn to talk there seemed to be a strange solemn oppressive knocking at her heart was it only the beat 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 of blood there were twelve pigs in that litter glenn was saying and now you see there are only nine i've lost three mountain lions bears coyotes wildcats are all likely to steal a pig and at first i was sure one of these varmints had been robbing me but as i could not find any tracks i knew i had to lay the blame on something else so i kept watch pretty closely in daytime and at night i shut the pigs up in the corner there 
where you see I've built a pen. Yesterday I heard squealing, and by George, I saw an eagle flying off with one of my pigs. Say I was mad. A great old bald-headed eagle. The regal bird you see with American stars and stripes had degraded himself to the level of a coyote. I ran for my rifle, and I took some quick shots at him as he flew up. Tried to hit him, too, but I failed. And the old rascal hung on to my pig. I watched him carry it to that sharp crag way up there on the rim. Poor little piggy, exclaimed Carly, to think of our American emblem, our stately bird of noble, warlike mien, our symbol of lonely grandeur and freedom of the heights. Think of him being a robber of pig pens. Glenn, I begin to appreciate the many-sidedness of things. Even my hide-bound narrowness is susceptible to change. It's never too late to learn. This should apply to the Society for the Preservation of the American Eagle. Glenn led her along the base of the wall to three other pens, in each of which was a fat old sow with a litter. At the last enclosure, that owing to dry soil was not so dirty, Glenn picked up a little pig and held it squealing out to Carly as she leaned over the fence. It was fairly white and clean, a little pink and fuzzy, and certainly cute with its curled tail. Carly Birch, take it in your hands, commanded Glenn. The feat seemed monstrous and impossible of accomplishment for Carly, yet such was her temper at the moment that she would have undertaken anything. Why, sure I will, as Flo says, replied Carly, extending her ungloved hands. Come here, Piggy, I christen you Pinky. And hiding an almost insupportable squeamishness from Glenn, she took the pig in her hands and fondled it. "'By George!' exclaimed Glenn in huge delight. "'I wouldn't have believed it. Carly, I hope you tell your fastidious and immaculate Morrison that you held one of my pigs in your beautiful hands.' "'Wouldn't it please you more to tell him yourself?' asked Carly. "'Yes, it would,' declared Glenn, grimly. This incident inspired Glenn to a Homeric narration of his hog-raising experience. In spite of herself, the content of his talk interested her, and as for the effect upon her of his singular enthusiasm, it was deep and compelling. The little boned Berkshire razorback hogs grew so large and fat and heavy that their bones broke under their weight. The Duroc jerseys were the best breed in that latitude, owing to their larger and stronger bones, that enabled them to stand up under the greatest accumulation of fat. Glenn told of his droves of pigs running wild in the canyon below. In summertime, they fed upon vegetation, and at other season on acorns, roots, bugs, and grubs. Acorns, particularly, were good and fattening feed. They ate cedar and juniper berries and pinion nuts, and therefore they lived off the land at little or no expense to the owner. The only loss was from beasts and birds of prey. Glenn showed Carly how a profitable business could soon be established. He meant to fence off side canyons and to segregate droves of his hogs, and to raise abundance of corn for winter feed. At that time there was a splendid market for hogs, a condition Hutter claimed would continue indefinitely in a growing country. In conclusion, Glenn eloquently told how in his necessity he had accepted gratefully the humblest of labors, to find in the hard pursuit of it a rejuvenation of body and mind, and a promise of independence and prosperity. When he had finished, and excused himself to go repair a weak place in the corral fence, Carly sat silent, wrapped in a strange meditation. Whither had faded the vulgarity and ignominy she had attached to Glenn's raising of hogs, gone like other miasmas of her narrow mind? Partly she understood him now. She shirked consideration of his sacrifice to his country. That must wait. But she thought of his work, and the more she thought, the less she wondered. First, he had labored with his hands. What infinite meaning lay unfolding to her vision? Somewhere out of it all came the conception that man was intended to earn his bread by the sweat of his brow. But there was more to it than that. By that toil and sweat, by the friction of horny palms, by the expansion and contractions of muscle, by the acceleration of blood, something great and enduring, something physical and spiritual, came to a man. She understood then 
why she would have wanted to surrender herself to a man made manly by toil she understood how a woman instinctively leaned toward the protection of a man who had used his hands who had strength and red blood and virility and who could fight like the progenitors of the race any toil was splendid that served this end for any man it all went back to the survival of the fittest and suddenly carley thought of morrison he could dance and dangle attendance upon her and amuse her but how would he have acquitted himself in a moment of peril she had her doubts most assuredly he could not have beaten down for her a ruffian like hayes ruff what then should be the significance of a man for a woman carley's querying and answering mind reverted to glenn he had found a secret in this seeking for something through the labors of hand all development of body must come through exercise of muscles the virility of cell and tissue and bone depended upon that thus he had found in toil the pleasure and reward athletes had in their desultory training but when a man learned the secret the need of work must become permanent did this explain the law of the persians that every man was required to sweat every day carley tried to picture to herself glenn's attitude of mind when he had first gone to work here in the west resolutely she now denied her shrinking cowardly sensitiveness she would go to the root of this matter if she had intelligence enough crippled ruined in health wrecked and broken by an inexplicable war soul blighted by the heartless callous neglect of government and public on the verge of madness at the insupportable facts he had yet been wonderful enough true enough to himself and god to fight for life with the instinct of a man to fight for his mind with a noble and unquenchable faith alone indeed he had been alone and by some miracle beyond the power of understanding he had found day by day in his painful efforts some hope and strength to go on he could not have had any illusions for glenn kilbourne the health and happiness and success most men held so dear must have seemed impossible his slow daily tragic and terrible task must have been something he owed himself not for carley birch she like all the others had failed him how carley shuddered in confession of that not for the country which had used him and cast him off carley divined now as if by a flash of lightning the meaning of glenn's strange cold scornful and aloof manner when he had encountered young men of his station as capable and as strong as he who had escaped the service of the army for him these men did not exist they were less than nothing they had waxed fat on lucrative jobs they had basked in the presence of girls whose brothers and lovers were in the trenches or on the turbulent sea exposed to the ceaseless dread and almost ceaseless toil of war if glenn's spirit had lifted him to endurance of war for the sake of others how then could it fail him in a precious duty of fidelity to himself carley could see him day by day toiling in his lonely canyon plodding to his lonely cabin he had been playing the game fighting it out alone as surely as he knew his brothers of like misfortune were fighting so glenn kilbourne loomed heroically in carley's transfigured sight he was one of carley's battle-scarred warriors out of his travail he had climbed on stepping stones of his dead self resuagram that had been his unquenchable cry who had heard it only the solitude of his lonely canyon only the waiting dreaming watching walls only the silent midnight shadows only the white blinking passionless stars only the wild creatures of his haunts only the moaning wind in the pines only these had been with him in his agony how near were these things to god carley's heart seemed full to bursting not another single moment could her mounting love abide in a heart that held a double purpose how bitter the assurance that she had not come west to help him it was self self all self that had actuated her unworthy indeed was she of the love of this man only a lifetime of devotion to him could acquit her in the eyes of her better self sweetly and madly raced the thrill and tumult of her blood there must be only one outcome to her romance 
yet the next instant there came a dull throbbing an oppression which was pain an impondering vague thought of catastrophe only the fearfulness of love perhaps she saw him complete his task and wipe his brown moist face and stride toward her coming nearer tall and erect with something added to his soldierly bearing with a light in his eyes she could no longer bear the moment for which she had waited more than two months had come at last glenn when will you go back east she asked tensely and low the instant the words were spent on her lips she realized that he had always been waiting and prepared for this question that had been so terrible for her to ask carley he replied gently though his voice rang i am never going back east an inward quivering hindered her articulation never she whispered never to live or stay any while he went on i might go some time for a little visit but never to live oh glenn she gasped and her hands fluttered out to him the shock was driving home no amaze no incredulity succeeded her reception of the fact it was a slow stab carley felt the cold blanch of her skin then this is it the something i felt strange between us yes i knew and you never asked me he replied that was it all the time you knew she whispered huskily you knew i'd never marry you never live out here yes carley i knew you'd never be woman enough american enough to help me reconstruct my broken life out here in the west he replied with a sad and bitter smile that flayed her an insupportable shame and wounded vanity and clamoring love contended for dominance of her emotions love beat down all else dearest i beg of you don't break my heart she implored i love you carley he answered steadily with piercing eyes on hers then come back home home with me no if you love me you will be my wife love you glenn i worship you she broke out passionately but i could not live here i could not carley did you ever read of the woman who said whither thou goest there will i go oh don't be ruthless don't judge me i never dreamed of this i came west to take you back my dear it was a mistake he said gently softening to her distress i'm sorry i did not write you more plainly but carley i could not ask you to share this this wilderness home with me i don't ask it now i always knew you couldn't do it yet you've changed so that i hoped against hope love makes us blind even to what we see don't try to spare me i'm slight and miserable i stand abased in my own eyes i thought i loved you but i must love best the crowd people luxury fashion the damned round of things i was born to carley you will realize their insufficiency too late he replied earnestly the things you were born to are love work children happiness don't don't they are hollow mockery to me she cried passionately glenn it is the end it must come quickly you are free i do not ask to be free wait go home and look at it again with different eyes think things over remember what came to me out of the west i will always love you and i will be here hoping i i cannot listen she returned brokenly as she clenched her hands tightly to keep from wringing them i i cannot face you here is is your ring you are free don't stop me don't come oh glenn good-bye with breaking heart she whirled away from him and hurried down the slope toward the trail the shade of the forest enveloped her peering back through the trees she saw glenn standing where she had left him as if already stricken by the loneliness that must be his lot a sob broke from carley's throat she hated herself she was in a terrible state of conflict decision had been wrenched from her but she sensed unending strife she dared not look back again stumbling and breathless she hurried on how changed the atmosphere and sunlight and shadow of the canyon the looming walls had pitiless eyes for her flight when she crossed the mouth of west fork an almost irresistible force breathed to her from under the stately pines an hour later she had bidden farewell to the weeping mrs hutter and to the white-faced flo and lolomi lodge 
and the murmuring waterfall and the haunting loneliness of Oak Creek Canyon. End of chapter 7, part 2